Welcome to May's ECR Wednesday webinar hosted by eLife, the series that aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss important issues to you and your research career. Today's webinar focuses on what could be done to reform the conference experience for organisers and participants. And your chair is Vinod. Over to you, Vinod. Um, thank you, Miranda. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, in today's Early Career Researchers Wednesday webinar. My name is Vinod Arangovan. I'm a member of the Early Career Advisory Group, and I will also moderate today's webinar. Um, so just to give a quick word about our host of today, uh, eLife. Uh, eLife is a nonprofit organization uh, that is operating a platform um, to uh, improve all aspects of research communication by encouraging and recognizing uh, the most uh, the responsible behaviors in research. Um, the role of uh, Early Career Advisory Group uh, is to influence and support eLab's work to catalyze uh, broad reforms in um, evaluation and communication of science, and uh, in particular, uh, to represent the needs and aspirations of researchers at uh, early stages in their careers uh, for a research culture that is uh, healthy both for science and scientists. Uh, this webinar series, ECI Wednesdays, is uh, just one such initiative that eLife has launched to uh, help support the ECI community. Um, so uh, before we go into uh, the webinar, I would like you uh, to remind you that uh, we are recording this webinar and we'll make it available on YouTube later. Um, so I request all of the participants who are joining uh, both synchronously and asynchronously to be respectful, honest, inclusive, accommodating, appreciative, open to learning from everyone else. Uh, kindly do not attack, demean, disrupt, harass, or threaten others or encourage, and encourage such behaviors. Uh, do not, um, if you feel uh, uncomfortable or uh, unwelcome at any of these webinars, please contact Eli by uh, email. Um, which is uh, events at elifesciences.org. And this uh, inbox is watched by Anya Stars, uh, who is joining us uh, from the back uh, back end. Um, and uh, the eLife uh, organizing committee um, has uh, reserves the right to ask anyone to leave or deny access to subsequent webinars. Uh, so if you need any um, help uh, during this webinar, uh, kindly direct your messages to Anya or uh, to Naomi. Uh, who is working from the uh, back end. Uh, to that, uh, I would like to actually welcome uh, all our panelists today. Um, so we have um, uh, with us today, uh, Annette David uh, from Swedish Agriculture, Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences, uh, Umberto Debat uh, from the National Institute of Agriculture Technology in Argentina, uh, Emily Lesac, uh, from the Code for Science and Society um, from the United States, uh, Sarvana Sarabipur uh, from Johns Hopkins University, United States, and Samantha Sia uh, from uh, European Molecular Biology Laboratories, Heidelberg, uh, Germany. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, to set the background for why we started thinking about this particular topic, conferences, all of us, uh, you know, uh, practicing researchers um, or uh, anyone who is in uh, any academic area would have uh, would be at attending conferences and conferences are one way of sharing our uh, current state of the art uh, or any novel findings that we uh, find from our research. Um, although conferences might serve as a platform for new discoveries, uh, there are a lot of barriers uh, for uh, many researchers across the globe, which has not been really carefully thought about. Um, and uh, currently uh, due to the situation of COVID-19 uh, and uh, it took us uh, one pandemic to realize that uh, the structures that we have been operating in order to share knowledge is not equitable. And uh, there's a lot of barriers for uh, several researchers across the globe. Um, and uh, if, you, if you look at the scientific endeavor or research in general, it's an endeavor that is carried out uh, globally um, together by all, all communities participating is participating in a very uh, inclusive way uh, so that we can push our boundaries of existing knowledge. Uh, but uh, we exclude uh, many demographic from uh, you know, sharing knowledge or participating in dialogue of uh, improving um, uh, knowledge around things. Um, and uh, for that particular reason, uh, so we were also uh, at the uh, ECAG, uh, the Early Career Res uh, Advisory Group, uh, we have thought beyond uh, the pandemic and how conferences uh, or canceling conferences due to pandemic can cause uh, several um, 
hindrances to uh, research careers of early career uh, researchers. Um, and uh, one of the particular um, initiatives that uh, we work in synergy with the uh, uh, eLife ambassadors um, is uh, actually uh, transformed into this webinar. Uh, so most of the uh, panelists today are uh, members of the eLife ambassadors um, and uh, they've uh, started this initiative almost around a year back uh, thinking about uh, you know, how conferences are exclusionary. And uh, Sarvina Sarabikor has been leading this initiative. And uh, so that is uh, available as a, a preprint. Uh, so their discussions have been uh, like, this is one of the research areas uh, that has been underlooked. And uh, they've, uh, uh, they kind of tried to collect data from different sources in order to really provide a data-driven approach to how conferences are exclusionary and what we can actually do to improve them. Uh, so uh, you could find that uh, preprint link uh, uh, somewhere. Um, so that will be posted in the chat or it's also in the Google Doc. Um, so before we move on to the panelists, uh, so before I open the floor to the panelists, I'll just uh, like to let you uh, know or remind you of certain logistics. Uh, so if you want to ask questions, uh, please feel free to ask that using the Zoom chat. Uh, so uh, we will uh, ask uh, all the panelists to share their stories initially, and then we will have uh, some time for discussion, which is probably 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and um, I will, uh, when the questions come, I'll read out your name and then I will ask the questions. And uh, in case that we are not able to ask those questions, we'll also copy that into the uh, public notes uh, document. And uh, if you're uncomfortable asking questions through Zoom, you could also use uh, the public document uh, to uh, ask questions. And then um, if you would like to be contributed uh, or if you'd like to be acknowledged for your contribution, uh, please also um, say whether, uh, how to contact you and with your name and so on. Um, with that, I would uh, now open the floor um, for the panelists. Uh, with that, uh, so one of the things that we've always been thinking about is, um, you know, how conferences are uh, conducted and uh, what it means to, uh, you know, most of us. Um, so in that, there's like a lot of challenge and in, in particular, uh, this, there could be demographic challenge and like traveling and so on. Uh, so I would like to call upon Annette, uh, Annette David, uh, to uh, present uh, what are the challenges that, that uh, researchers have been facing towards attending in-person conferences. Uh, and I would particularly like you to uh, elaborate on the perspective of uh, African scientists and their challenges. Uh, Annette, please. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Vinod. Um, so when it comes to the African perspective, one of the challenges of attending the conferences in the format they are right now is the cost to attending these conferences can be forbidding to many scientists from the continent as most of them, they come from resource constrained uh, settings. So one of the biggest uh, sources of the cost is uh, travel and accommodation costs. And unless we find travel grants, most of us cannot afford, or our labs cannot afford to uh, cannot afford to pay for us to attend conferences. So also sometimes we have to pay for the visa fees and sometimes scientists are asked to cover their travel and accommodation costs only to be refunded later, which is also another complicated process. And as a result, many scientists cannot afford to go to these conferences and they're excluded from the process. So our contribution, our voices are missing from the global scientific or uh, from the world scientific picture. Another challenge that we as African uh, scientists face is the process to get the visa to look at the shared screen now. Uh, some countries are very lucky and their residents can travel to many destinations without requiring a visa uh, or they get a visa on arrival. But many countries, especially in some countries in Africa, including my country, we don't have visa on arrival or we don't have visa free entry to other places in the world. And many conferences are hosted either in Europe or North America. And the process to get a visa into these countries uh, is, is quite cumbersome. Apart from being expensive, it's cumbersome and the rejection rate is quite high. And some of the reasons which are cited, uh, like a scientist does not have a stable base at home, maybe they don't have a family, so maybe they will not come back or they don't have a stable income or they don't have a stable job. So despite being a scientist and have an invitation later, but still there, are always, there is always a reason to deny a visa entry to certain countries. 
And this also causes a lot of emotional trauma. You go through the process, you pay all the fees, and you have to book accommodation in advance, and then only to be rejected. And it's documented systemic exclusion of scientists from certain African countries. And this problem can be aggravated by political issues. And or Somalia, they have been in a, in a list of banned countries to go to places like the US and other developed countries follow suit. If you say these residents from these countries are not welcome in the US, for example, so other developed nations will follow suit. So issues like natural disasters, political situations or health concerns like the way we have now or Ebola makes it a bit more difficult for scientists from uh, African countries to get entry into places where conferences are hosted and many conferences are not hosted in our countries in Africa anyway so you always have to travel to other places so I think uh, having digital meetings uh, going into digital meetings digital conferences may be beneficial. It may be to make sure more scientists more from the continent participate in academic conferences. So it's digital conferences in a different form. They can be virtual, they can be semi-virtual. It may be easier for more people to access them. It may be easier to have a diverse group of participants. And if done correctly, it will be more inclusive. So for people who have had kids recently, they may not be able to travel very easily. Uh, they're much more affordable. The cost to attend the digital conference is much more, uh, is much less, more flexible for researchers. If you feature things like recorded talks, which somebody can watch at their own convenient time, so it's more flexible for people to attend, but also they save money. So there are many advantages to digital conferences. Uh, another uh, alternative which we explored is having semi virtual multi location conferences or academic meetings where scientists meet from, a, from at a hub in a region or in a country or at the academic institution or research institute and they connect to other scientists globally. Uh, so we have like a will and spoke more can converse, so they can network locally, but they can network with other scientists in the world. So if we try to find ways and to make digital conferences viable and try to find ways around the problems like uh, internet bandwidth or time zones uh, or try to have fewer bigger meetings in rotations i think we can have meetings which are more impactful effective inclusive and yeah more diverse so that is what i would say in my perspective as an african scientist is Uh, thank you, Annette, uh, for that uh, nice uh, introduction into, um, you know, how conferences are really exclusive. And, um, you know, now that if you are, you know, for a person like me who might not have the similar issues that, uh, you know, uh, Annette uh, had already pointed out, uh, you would probably like get probably able to get visas and then maybe able to travel and you know maybe able to uh, get some funding for attending the conferences uh, but when you travel there's also a lot of uh, you know uh, damage that we do to the environment and so on so we should also probably be mindful about uh, what we can do in order to protect the environment um, maybe it's a bit too late but as scientists we always wanted to improve the world around us and uh, in that respect i would like to invite uh, samantha Sia, uh, to answer this particular question about uh, what an env environmental impacts do in-person conferences have and have they implemented or ha have the organizers of uh, different conferences implemented any green strategies into their organizations and uh, so i would also like to ask samantha this question about um, how do you think a switch to predominantly holding virtual conferences will uh, reduce uh, research or carbon footprint? Samantha, please. Yep. Hi, thanks, Vinod. Um, yep, so I'm Samantha, and um, I think the largest environmental impact of conferences comes from air travel. So aviation is a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and thus to global warming. So just think about the fact that a single return journey from London to Perth, as you can see on the map, um, it generates approximately 3.47 tons of CO2. And this is um, already 36% of the per capita emissions of the average person from the UK. 
but these 3.47 tons are already more than the per capita emissions in 109 other countries, which you can see shaded in brown in the map. Now think about the fact that this is for a single scientist going to a single conference. A mid-sized conference with, a with hundreds of thousands of people would be responsible for a massive amount of emissions. So the total carbon footprint from, from a single annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience, which has 31,000 attendees, is actually equivalent to the annual carbon footprint of a thousand medium-sized laboratories. This is no small feat because the electricity used from a single minus 80 freezer is already equivalent to that from a single family household in the UK. And if you look at it from the Institute's perspective, air travel for business, which is largely air travel for conferences, um, actually forms a huge proportion of any Institute's carbon emissions. So for example, if we look at um, EPFL in Switzerland, 31% of their emissions actually comes from air travel for business. And this really illustrates the sheer impact of air travel in scientific society. Um, of course, there are other problems with um, in-person conferences, other environmental issues. So conferences also produce huge amounts of waste in the form of you know, merchandise, program booklets, as well as disposable containers for food, drinks, and so on. And um, of the 6% of conferences in our database that have sustainability policies, most have begun to tackle these issues. So many speak about minimizing waste, encouraging recycling, and so on. I mean, for example, you, you see that many conferences are switching to online program booklets, which are more sustainable and can also be more user-friendly than traditional program booklets. Um, I've also noticed that conference organizers are slowly moving towards serving more vegetarian, more vegan food, as well as more locally sourced food while trying to avoid the use of disposable cutlery. These are all very good first steps to raise awareness about these issues, but arguably they don't really tackle the bulk of the environmental impact of conferences, which comes from travel. So regarding travel, some conferences with sustainability policies um, actually offset what they term as unavoidable travel, which I think is a, a nice gesture. I mean, it acknowledges the fact that travel generates a lot of emissions, but I mean, quite frankly, I, I'm not entirely convinced by the value of offsets. And I think it would make more sense um, for organizers and institutions to encourage a switch to more sustainable travel methods. I mean, this, is, this can be quite challenging because um, the aviation industry is fairly heavily subsidized. So this means that flight tickets can often be disproportionately cheaper than more sustainable alternatives. So of course, institutions must somehow cater for this rather than just merely subsidizing the cheapest travel option. For example, they could consider um, you know, um, financially including the environmental impact of air travel by imposing a flight tax. Or you, know, you can set other types of restrictions, for example, for minimum distance. So you could introduce a policy that says that travel that can be done within five hours by train must be done by train rather than by plane. But a, a big problem is that flying is pretty much the only reasonable way to cross oceans. So a solution to this is to have multi-location conferences, as NF mentioned. So you would have kind of hubs located in different continents. This minimizes the distances that participants and speakers would have to travel while still providing in-person interactions with regional colleagues. However, the solution is not entirely equitable because probably the locations chosen would be in existing research hubs and would continue to exclude our colleagues from the global south and from Asia and the Pacific and so on. So a better solution would actually be to move away from the need to travel altogether by having fully virtual conferences. So these not only eliminate travel related emissions, but also make conferences much more accessible to many people. So for example, those who have disabilities, those who have caregiving responsibilities, to those who struggle to obtain visas, to those who just may not have the funding to fly across the world for a conference and so on. I'm from Singapore originally, and Singapore is geographically distant from many of the big prestigious conferences in Europe and in the US. And you have to fly 12 hours to Europe or 18 hours to the US. And to do this just for a three-day conference, it's terrible for the environment, it's physically and mentally tiring, it's also ridiculously expensive. And you know, as Anna has mentioned, very few ECRs can financially afford to frequently fly across half the world. So I believe that the pandemic has you know, given many organizers that 
extra push to change how conferences are carried out. Of course, you know, there have been many teasing problems in trying to establish virtual conferences in this time, but I think that this is a great time to figure out the problems and to work to fix them. And well, I'm quite hopeful because I think that the lessons that uh, have been learned in this time will really advance our move towards more sustainable and more equitable conferences. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much very excited to see where we go from here. Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, that was really um, very mind opening. Um, and um, you know, now that we have known uh, what impacts or environmental impacts uh, are uh, there while attending an in-person conference uh, by flying across the continent, um, I would now uh, like to uh, call upon uh, Umberto Debat uh, to present his views on uh, what he thinks of whether a shift to predominantly holding virtual conferences will um, impact the academic uh, academics globally, and also particularly from the Latin American perspective, uh, where um, you know uh, this. Uh, there's like a close-knit uh, Latin American communities or scientific communities where uh, you can kind of hold local conferences as we have been discussing about and uh, how that uh, can kind of translate into providing a global uh, participation in the knowledge base. Or production. Hello to everyone and thank you for the invitation. The short answer, virtual conference will allow researchers of Latin America and other developing regions to participate in scientific dialogue at international meetings, which is something we are being excluded from. There are multiple factors rendering a marginalization of Latin America in terms of participation in scholar communications during scholar meetings. I'm going to give some quick context about our region regarding inequalities in technology, infrastructure research and development spending, grant and fellowships and salaries. Latin America consists of 20 countries, 13% of the Earth's land surface area with a population of over 652 million people. That's actually 8.5% of the world population, but we have 3.6% of global researchers, 0.3% of global patents, 3.4% of global spending on research, and only 5.9% of global scientific publications. Some chronic issues of the region in R&D are limited access to grant opportunities, inadequate budgets, substandard levels of laboratory infrastructure and equipment, the high cost and limited supply of reagents, inadequate salaries, and job insecurity of scientists. For instance, R&D spending as percentage of the GDP in South America is low. It goes from 0.05 in Trinidad and Tobago to 1.24% in Brazil, in contrast to OECD countries with an average of 2.4%. An R&D indicator are researchers per million people, which goes from 14 in Guatemala to less than 1,200 in Argentina in contrast to the OECD average, which is 4,000. We have tremendous disparities within the region in terms of poverty, access to health and services and unemployment. All in all, Latin America is a region with the highest level of income inequality in the world. To end this list with a positive note, Latin America has one of the highest share of women researchers, 44%, which in contrast to the 28% of the world average is quite good. In the slide, you can see what we found out regarding estimated money spent on 270 conferences, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. I read yesterday in a study entitled The Significance of Medicines to the U.S. Economy, which estimates that 200 million people attended nearly 1.8 million meetings in the U.S. in 2009. Those meetings aggregated as the MICE industry, which is meetings, incentive conferences, and events that generated $263 billion in direct spending. 28%, which is 73 billion, is calculated to be spent on Congress, conference, and conventions. Among that huge amount of money, there wasn't a specific item that got my attention. Recreation and entertainment stands for $6 billion. I'm going to repeat that, $6 billion in recreation and entertainment. That figure alone is equivalent to our country complete yearly budget on R&D or 15 times the R&D budget of Peru or 25 times the one from Uruguay. 
So as a region where two thirds of the investment and funding for research and development comes directly from public funds, financial support of research is not only an economical issue, but also an ethical one. So there is some evidence that the international scholarly media landscape has been co-opted by the mice industry, a highly profitable business. The anachronic and unsustainable traditional conference parting evolved in an era before mass communication and global connectivity, when it was necessary to travel in order to meet and present to peers academic results. The big question is, what are we getting today out of this huge amount of money? I will try to describe this tension to the equivalent of a scholarly publishing and the role of the Global South in scholarly communications. We have experienced the long but sustained shift of scholarly communication as a market with extreme profits due to the peculiarity of the economic of scholarly publishing and no oligopoly from academic publishers in the digital era where the top five most prolific commercial publishers combined account for more than 50% of all journal articles. On the other hand, Latin America has created and maintains a non-commercial structure where scientific publication belongs to the academic institution and not to large publishers, where knowledge is managed as a commons by the scholarly community that is not by a state or market, but by a community of users that self governs them. The scholarly communication not outsourced to commercial publisher has rendered a thriver open access ecosystem in Latin America. The region has a long tradition of regional information network to provide open access to its research results. In the absence of commercial academic publisher, which is the model prevailing in developing regions, free publishing and distribution of scientific and academic publication has been the norm. So this academic-led and non-for-profit model has been a natural form of scientific communication for over two decades in Latin America. Returning to scientific meetings, we should ask ourselves about the public role of scientific conference and knowledge in our societies. I believe that this particular scholarly communications model could be rapidly implemented in light of virtual conference, enable inclusive dialogue oriented to the advance of science and the quality of human life. This shift will contribute to the democratization of production and access to knowledge necessary for the development of our societies. A regional meeting budget for a European or North American research institution is an affordable for a developing region institution. In face academic meeting, as a kind of conference tourism, are leaving behind a multitude of diverse insights from researchers from less privileged regions. All in all, every time that we are asked whether we prefer in-person versus virtual meeting, we should remember that that is only a choice for a limited privileged share of researchers. Besides anecdotal social networking and informal meets, there are not many tangible outputs returning as long-term benefits to the global research community and to the society it serves. I believe that we should promote inclusive and participatory meetings under the umbrella of access to knowledge as a human right and its management as a commons by the scholarly community in a context of diverse, multiple, genuine and participatory dialogue we may sustain through democratization of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Umberto. That was really profound about uh, democratizing knowledge as a right. Um, so uh, that leads to uh, me to now, uh, you know, think about uh, how we can democratize in the current situation and how you know that we can put that in a or improve that in a better way. Uh, for that, up next is uh, Emily Lassac. I would uh, like to invite Emily. Uh, and so Emily has experience uh, organizing a lot of uh, uh, virtual conferences. And so I'd like to ask, uh, what's your experience attending and organizing virtual conferences so far? And what do you think uh, we can improve upon that? Uh, Emily, please. All right, thank you for the introduction. And I just want to make one clarification. I don't have experience organizing virtual conferences, <laughs> um, but I have attended quite a few. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about my role. Um, so I'm the conference fund manager at Code for Science and Society. And this is a nonprofit based in the United States um, that provides fiscal sponsorship and project management support for research driven open data science projects. And I'm leading a new initiative there uh, to create a uh, funding mechanism uh, to fund conferences and events in research driven open data science and our due to um, current global situation, our first uh, request for proposals will be for entirely virtual meetings. 
Um, so what I'll be talking about today is based on what I have learned about virtual meetings um, from attending them myself and from talking to conference organizers and in conversations that I have about that I've had about um, taking best practices and in in-person conference planning and translating that to a virtual platform. And I'll end today um, with how uh, virtual meetings have potential to particularly benefit the early researcher community. Uh, so the scientific workforce has had to learn how to maintain productivity at a distance from labs, offices, field sites, and colleagues. Over the last few months, we've had to learn how to access our information and tools remotely and rely on online platforms for communicating with lab members, students, and collaborators. Uh, most of us haven't received formal training in remote work and communication strategies, so this tr transition has certainly been a learning process. One of the areas of science that has been dramatically impacted is the scientific meeting. As scientists, we value opportunities to interact with our colleagues, to share our research, build our skills, and launch new collaborations. And these occasions are highly valuable opportunities for the early career researcher or ECR community to showcase their work and make connections that can help them advance to the next career stage. These meetings may also provide opportunities for ECRs to engage in workshops focused on science communication, peer review, and career planning that are not available at their home institutions. So because of the value that's placed on these gatherings, scientific societies and conference organizers have been reluctant to cancel scheduled meetings and instead have gone through great lengths to quickly pivot to online formats to continue to meet the needs of their members. We've seen local, national, and international meetings and workshops convert to virtual formats in just a matter of weeks with great success. And we've learned a lot from this first wave of virtual events. The most important lesson is that virtual meetings can be done and they can be done well. Conference organizers can no longer default to, tr to traditional practices, which can be exclusive to participants who may already feel marginalized in their communities. Rather, we're at a turning point at which organizers can be proactive about innovating practices and working toward inclusivity. So today I'll share with you some challenges in planning meetings, how we can turn these challenges into opportunities, and how the ECR community in particular can benefit from the transition to virtual meetings. So as the preprint pointed out, virtual meeting planning presents many of the same challenges as in-person meeting planning. And one of these challenges is accessibility. So how can conference planners ensure that everyone who wants to participate can to the fullest possible extent? I encourage conference planners to arrange for sign language interpretation and or closed captioning as one means of accommodation and also consider providing opportunities for participants to engage not only over video conferencing, but also through written communication. So for example, over Slack or shared Google Docs to take into account different communication preferences and allow for conversations to extend over a longer period of time. Consider how to engage participants from different time zones and allow opportunities for asynchronous viewing of presentations and participation. For example, the Bioinformatics Community Conference, which will be held virtually for the first time this summer, will create schedules for both the Eastern and Western time zones to allow for equitable global participation. Moving to a virtual format improves accessibility for members of the scientific community who cannot easily travel, such as government scientists, caregivers, and ECRs. Members of these groups may already feel marginalized in their scientific communities, and the difficulty of having to travel to meetings can exacerbate these sentiments. By hosting meetings online, all participants with internet access can have a level playing field with regard to participation and have their voices heard. The huge spikes in numbers of attendees at virtual events as compared to in-person meetings demonstrate that there are barriers to participation. And when they're alleviated, the number and likely the diversity of attendees grows. Another challenge facing meeting planners concerns building and sustaining connections among participants. In-person meetings tend to have plenty of opportunities for informal networking and socializing during poster sessions or at meal times that can be difficult to replicate in virtual space. However, there is variability in the extent to which all participants can partake in these uh, socializing opportunities. So caregivers, for example, um, their downtime is often devoted to kids and families. And for ECRs, particularly those traveling to a meeting alone, these times in the schedule can be awkward and intimidating. Interacting in virtual space with attendees, either synchronously or asynchronously, allows participants to engage in communication at times when it's convenient to do so and can lower the barrier for individuals who are newer to the community. 
One of the challenges of interacting in virtual space is being able to replicate the warm, fuzzy feeling that in-person meetings can create when participants are in an immersive experience for an extended length of time. But it is important to point out that meetings can also generate stress and anxiety in participants, particularly those who may already feel marginalized, and that it is possible to create meaningful connections using virtual platforms. Here I think ECRs are in a position of privilege because we are by and large just as comfortable communicating and community building online as you may be in person, if not more so. We engage regularly in Slack communities such as Future PI, Friends of Joe's Big Idea, and Scientific Society leadership teams. And though we may have never met our colleagues in these spaces in person, we feel comfortable sharing career advice, peer editing, and collaborating on projects. So with both in-person and online meetings, participants either hop on a plane or close their video conferencing window at the end, and there tends to be little follow-up afterward. I encourage conference organizers to think about ways of engaging participants through more long-term avenues, such as Slack communities that can sustain conversations and connections. And I also strongly encourage the use of digital archiving of talks and posters so that attendees can provide feedback and ask questions after the event is over. Another challenge facing virtual conference organizers has to do with technology, including what platforms to choose for the event and solving technical challenges that arise with speakers and participants. However, in-person meetings also have a strong reliance on technology, including AV systems, online programs, and archiving services. Successful virtual conference organizers take the time to practice talks with speakers in advance to make sure that there are no issues or questions associated with the technology. And I also encourage conference organizers to have a dedicated tech support team in place to handle issues that arise in much the same way that in-person meetings have volunteers or staff on site to help presenters load talks and to troubleshoot AV problems. The last challenge that I'll touch on has to do with creating and enforcing a code of conduct. While codes of conduct are becoming more common and expected, they may largely be written with in-person gatherings and interactions in mind. So conference organizers need to ensure that they have codes of conduct with clear guidelines for reporting that extend to interactions in virtual spaces. Scientific meetings have become critical to advancing our careers. We need to show advisors, commit committees, and funders how we've disseminated our research to broad audiences. However, accessing traditional in-person meetings is costly and time consuming. And this is amplified for ECRs with families or caregiving responsibilities and those living in remote regions. Switching to a virtual platform increases access to these populations and may increase the abilities of ECRs as a whole to engage with other participant, participants and to disseminate their work. As a community, ECRs are at an advantage because we are accustomed to learning new technology and are comfortable interacting in virtual space. So I encourage ECRs who have the capacity to volunteer to be on conference planning committees so that you can get an inside view of the process and use your voice to advocate for meaningful change. And if you're not able to access the lab or your field site this summer, I recommend that you look into the wealth of online training sessions and workshops that are surfacing focused on the development of professional and technical skills. If there's a training or engagement gap at your institution or within your scientific community that can be filled through a virtual conference or workshop, I encourage you if you have the time to collaborate with others to organize your own virtual event. Bear in mind that virtual events still cost money and take time to plan, but they do avoid many of the financial and log logistical challenges of in-person events, such as booking a venue and a caterer. So this format can open up opportunities for new or emerging conference organizers and events. So I encourage you to apply your creativity, innovation, and technological know-how to this emerging area and advocate for practices and values that promote equity and inclusion. And again, if you're interested in getting involved in conference planning, uh, Code for Science and Society will be releasing a call for proposals this summer for virtual events that are centered on tools, practices, and communities and open data science that drive scholarship. And we're particularly keen to support organizers who aim to increase inclusivity and broaden participation in data science. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, that was really insightful. Um, now, um, now that I've also been uh, tracking the questions, so maybe now it's the time to really um, reveal the trump card of this uh, webinar. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Sarvana uh, Sarabekpur uh, to address the questions on what improvements can be implemented in the virtual mode for benefits of both attendees and speakers. And uh, you know, 
apart from that, uh, in particular, if you can touch upon uh, what role should the funders and the scientific societies uh, have in uh, redesigning the scholarly meetings? Uh, should these virtual conferences be more uh, inclusive of researchers of uh, you know, career stages, uh, geographies, and so on? Um, so I would like uh, Sarvanas to uh, address these questions. Sarvanas, please. Hi, um, thank you for uh, all the wonderful discussions. It's going to be really hard to match those. Um, so I will start with institutions and I think that um, as was briefly mentioned by, by our panelists, uh, of course institutions can reduce um, air-based travel and uh, invest and support uh, more of the ground-based and multi-site uh, conferences. And this could be uh, easier to, uh, in terms of accessibility as well. And of course, uh, there's always a need in some institutions uh, to invest in um, digital uh, setup, uh, conference rooms and uh, audiovisual facilities, and they can have uh, long-term benefits, not just for this meeting. Uh, now, in terms of funders, funders can do a lot. And uh, we think that there are um, policy changes that needs to be made uh, that support low carbon careers. So these are basically um, mandates that acknowledge and encourage uh, participation in virtual conferences and acknowledge those abstracts and those involvements and actually incentivizes um, organizing virtual conferences. We also uh, realize that this is uh, a topic that is very important to me. Uh, we examined uh, inclusivity in terms of gender and uh, also career stage. And as you can see in our visuals, we found that uh, most conferences are not very inclusive. And this um, equity and inclusivity has to come in the planning of the conference and will uh, provide fair opportunities for everyone. Uh, we found that many conferences, most, don't have a, a statement on gender balance and um, majority don't have a diversity statement and even when they do, the quality varies greatly. So funders have um, mandates uh, and incentives for uh, diversity and inclusivity and I think that they need to expand those and actually hold uh, conferences accountable for um, their statistics. Uh, we also think that conferences have to release the statistics of their attendees and their speakers. We found that um, the positions of conference chairs, session chairs, uh, many of the uh, invited speakers, uh, there is no equity in those. And we think that uh, conference organizers can take much better use of um, online lists of women and LGBTQI scientists that are available. Uh, PIs can actually recommend their trainees, their uh, female trainees to go and speak in their place uh, virtually or if, if multi-site in person. And we also think that in terms of career stage, there is a lot to be done. We found that there aren't a lot of networking opportunities for ECRs, even in in-person conferences that we examined. And we think that uh, these have to be really uh, concerted efforts. These shouldn't be meetings by chance uh, and, and serendipitous uh, meetings that scientists uh, uh, would like to have sometimes. Uh, so there are uh, apps, of course, that uh, organizers of virtual conferences can use and have been using. And uh, these apps allow attendees to interact. Of course, Slack was mentioned, which is um, also great. Um, and also uh, some new our conferences have used matching algorithms to um, facilitate chatting between attendees and speakers of, of similar interests. Uh, and finally, we, we do think that there is a lot to be done in terms of providing training for ECRs. And, um, this has to do with uh, the number and quality of the workshops uh, that were offered in in-person conferences. And we think that they weren't sufficient and uh, they could uh, dramatically improve. So um, during, after, before conferences, virtual conferences, uh, there could be much better workshops that uh, cater to the needs of ECRs at this time, uh, at this year, in this decade. Um, we also hope that 
PIs and organizers um, help sponsor ECRs. Uh, they could cut longer talks to have shorter talks and many more ECRs uh, chairing the sessions, uh, speaking, of course, in the sessions, and also um, having a chance uh, to interact virtually. And these virtual interactions can actually be much less intimidating than approaching an established scholar in person. Uh, so uh, basically, um, we, we think that uh, accessibility is an issue and uh, having easier access to conferences via virtual mode will solve some of the inclusivity issues, but not all. There has to be concerted efforts uh, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Sabi. Um, that was really awesome. Um, I hope uh, there were a lot of questions and some of the questions have been already answered during the discussion, but um, now that uh, I need to just go back and uh, look into that, um, uh, I will you know, bring the questions in. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for providing their wonderful insights into how we can improve or actually reform conferences. Uh, so hopefully uh, you all got a, a nice uh, idea about what to do. And there are several questions, so I will try to go um, over there. Uh, but before that, uh, if you have any questions, please type in the Zoom chat. Uh, or I'm very sorry, I've been muted. So uh, thank you very much, Sari, for um, this uh, excellent uh, talk. And I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to um, thank all the panelists for uh, bringing their uh, wonderful insights and in reforming conferences. Uh, so that's uh, really uh, great. Uh, so I'd like to remind uh, that uh, now we will put all the questions to the panelists. Uh, there are a lot of uh, interactions that have been happening. So I'll, I'll try to you know, scan through them and then uh, go one by one. Uh, but in the meanwhile, um, if you want to ask any question, please our chat um, or uh, you could also post your questions in the Google Doc or the public document and uh, you could also use uh, ECI Wednesday hashtag um, using uh, eLife community uh, in the uh, in through Twitter um, so now I'll just go into the questions um, so I'm just scanning through um, so you know uh, maybe like one of the questions that was um, uh, reflecting on a few of the questions asked by uh, maybe uh, Emmanuel, uh, Raina, and also uh, Norman. Um, so I would just, um, you know, I, I don't want to read all the questions, but maybe I just uh, I paraphrase that question and then uh, let's uh, let's see if uh, anyone, any of the panelists wants to answer. Uh, maybe if I had to like uh, shorten it, it's um, which do you think is the pervasive constraints preventing scientific conferences reform? Um, to Sarvi, do you want to go on that? Um, yes, sure. So I do think that um, a change of uh, culture and thinking is definitely required. We, uh, we need to be rethinking how we are, uh, we are organizing these conferences. And this uh, needs to happen at the researcher stage, at the organizer stage, uh, institutional stage, and of course, uh, funders. And everyone can help with that. I really, um, um, my thoughts resonate with what Emily mentioned, which is um, we don't need to wait for scientific societies to organize conferences for us. We can actually get together as researchers in our own fields and start organizing this. So uh, these inhibitions and barriers can really be removed if we, if we think and restructure uh, these meetings. Uh, there are, of course, obvious incentives to, to travel, as was mentioned uh, by Samantha, but, uh, but uh, virtual conferences are much more time efficient and they bring a larger diversity of ideas and diversity brings excellence. So we have all the incentives to, to, uh, to go and uh, hold these virtually, mostly virtually, if not uh, for four years to come. Um, is there any other panelists, do they want to add on it? Or uh, then I will just go to the next question. Um, 
So maybe I can uh, ask uh, the question from uh, Sami. Uh, maybe this is for Emily. Uh, what was your best virtual conference experience? Uh, is there any case where you thought uh, that all worked well and was supportive in terms of communication, community building, and so on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I can think of two that I went to uh, recently. One was the lead dev meeting. Um, which is focused on engineering and another was CMX global, which is focused on community managers. Um, and those are both very large meetings. Um, but what was great about them is that everything ran smoothly. They're very professionally run. Um, and you could tell that the organizers took a lot of time in advance to make sure that to the best of their ability that there were not going to be technological issues that the transition would run smoothly there are very clear instructions and guidelines for participants to be able to navigate uh, the different platforms that were used and um, what i liked in particular about the lead dev meeting um, is that there is a slack channel that's associated with it and so it's possible to continue conversations once the meeting is over um, and um, to continue to engage participants and they still have um, fairly regular programming for the folks who went to that meeting. Um, so, so it's possible to build community there. Um, kind of in general, some of the best things I've seen from virtual conference planning um, is making sure that the time is put in ahead of time to make sure that the technology works and the speakers know how to use it. Um, and also, again, making sure there's clear instructions and guidelines for participating and also the use of digital archiving um, so that the presentations um, and the materials can be made available afterward um, for people to continue to use the material um, and ask questions and interact with it. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, Salvi, did you want to add on that? Yes, and just uh, to add on what Emily said, with uh, recorded archives, you can actually attend the entire conference, <laughs> unlike the in-person conferences, which have hundreds of sessions running in parallel, and you barely have the chance to attend a few during the day. You can uh, watch the entire conference uh, at your own time zone when you want, and you can also attend tens of conferences a year, which weren't really uh, possible. So the democratization mm -hmm. of knowledge and accessibility are just phenomenal for, for for the entire um, research community. Um, I think uh, related to that, uh, there's another question from Frank. Um, so we are hearing a lot about uh, Zoom fatigue. Uh, will a three-day set of virtual conference sessions be more than uh, people can bear? Um, do anyone want to answer that? Or maybe Samantha? <laughs> mm, I mean, yeah, definitely. I think Zoom fatigue is, is a thing, but I think it's it's up to the conference organizers to figure out how to space out the talks and the interactions such that it would kind of resemble a real life conference if that's what um, you want to do. And in that way, I mean, I don't think it would um, exhaust people very much more than a, a three day conference in real life would. But I think another important point um, that has also been made by Savi, for example, is that um, having virtual conference sessions really gives us the opportunity to archive the material and to make it accessible for people over a longer period of time. And then people can go back and watch the talks and also interact at a later date. And I think this is also very important because it gives, um, it kind of ensures that the, the viewers themselves are able to space out what the, the information that they receive from the computer. So I could imagine that this would help people who suffer from Zoom fatigue, you know, that they could make a choice to say, you know what, I'm gonna watch this over a week or two weeks rather than in one three day stretch. And there, you know, that the conversations would take place over a longer time and they will be more sustained. And I think this also feeds into the networking, you know, how to build networks with other people online. I think this would all generally help while trying to reduce the amount of fatigue that people are experiencing just by spending all day watching talks. Yep, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Samantha. Um, I think this uh, one, um, so we are in the interest of time, um, I just wanted to focus on one of the most important question, uh, which is uh, from um, Mary Rose Frankel. Uh, she, she had asked, uh, sharing results before publication is a valuable function of scientific conferences. And uh, how do you address speakers' hesitancy in sharing unpublished results in an open forum like virtual or recorded uh, webinars? Um, 
Umberto, do you want to go on that? Well, okay, one, one aspect of uh, public sharing of scientific results could be solved with the use of preference. We are using preference to, to communicate in real time our discoveries and results and to discuss them as a community of scholars. In fact, we have taken back control of when we put that online and when we enable discussions of scientific results. So uh, there is a lot of, of, of preliminary dialogue in, in scientific conference, but, but I do think it could be replaced by other platforms and infrastructures uh, which have been developing with great strengths as open source, broad um, community services. Thank you for that. Um, so I think there's also some related question that was uh, asked by, um, yeah. Just uh, scanning through questions because there's like a lot of uh, bit of redundancy with the questions, so just trying to rephrase them. Um, well, there's another one uh, which is um, asked by um, many people actually. Um, uh, including uh, Emmanuel Reynaud, uh, where, uh, you know, if we can get away with scientific conferences at all, uh, what would happen to the, uh, you know, uh, the sponsors and so on, and uh, how would they interact and how that would financially uh, feed back and forth. Um, so I, I'd like to ask um, any of the panelists to jump into that. Um, I can talk about sponsorship. Um, so uh, with our call for proposals um, that we'll be releasing this summer for virtual events, um, we are encouraging applicants to budget for things like um, professional closed captioning, sign language interpreters, um, community organizers, um, professional tech support. So these types of resources that will increase accessibility and broaden participation um, these would be some of the things that um, sponsors could cover. Um, if there is a, um, a registration fee, um, then sponsors could cover or could waive um, registration fees, um, particularly for those groups that are traditionally underrepresented in the community. Um, so those are some of the ideas that we're thinking about. Um, thanks for that. Um, so I'm looking to the uh, next question. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll like to call upon Annette uh, for um, answering this question maybe. Um, so uh, so uh, Sundar asks, uh, in current day conferences, younger researchers rarely get to meet and talk to more established scientists and discuss their work. And uh, he understands that it's hard uh, given the number of people attending the conferences. Uh, do you think uh, virtual conferences will improve this or will it even make worse? Um, yeah, so thank you for the question. I think virtual conferences, they're not a magic bullet for all the challenges of uh, academic conferences. I think there is still a lot of work that is needed around planning. So, so to make sure we avoid the same issues that come with the physical conferences. And I think there are already explorations and ideas on how to make networking more effective. And as she's mentioned, some people are not very comfortable to reaching out to people face-to-face uh, -face and trying to network and connect to them. So the ideas which people have been exploring on how connections or connections based on algorithms, but also trying to use chan uh, channels like Slack or Twitter, uh, which are platforms which already exist for communication. Uh, for networking with, with among, really try to look for ways to make networking effective it may be possible to find meaningful connection among participants especially early career scientists and it's much easier to reach out to somebody uh, by text or by tweet than going to introduce yourself hi i'm so and so in a physical conference actually myself i haven't done that before in a physical conference or workshop so I think there is uh, an opportunity here to make um, networking more inclusive even. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, well, uh, we have many questions, but uh, 
we are almost at the top of the hour. So uh, I would like to kind of close uh, the session by maybe, you know, asking a question for myself, how do I see conferences in the next 10 years? And, uh, or, you know, if uh, any of the panelists wants to jump on this, uh, feel free uh, feel free to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, try and close it uh, by saying that, um, you know, uh, for the future, conferences need to be more inclusive, effective, uh, you know, in terms of structure and uh, engagement, and um, also environmentally sustainable, um, and also sustainable for the researchers and the research culture in general. Uh, so that is where I see the future. And uh, this particular webinar, or you know, uh, all the discussions that surrounding us, uh, is a starting point, or or you know, something to break the ice and then to go deeper. Uh, so I hope we will be able to reform this. And I think it's time that we uh, we change or we value uh, things that are different and uh, improve our research culture around us. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank all the panelists and all the questions, uh, all, all the participants for bringing in very uh, uh, fantastic discussion. Um, so all the questions will be recorded in the live document. And uh, we would encourage you to keep asking questions and discussing this using Easy and Stay hashtag over Twitter. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank again all the panelists and participants for joining in this webinar. Um, and um, before closing, I would also like to let you know that there is um, the next webinar will be on 24th June uh, about intersectionality, uh, which again is something that is closely related. So this is going to feed back and forth on how we can improve uh, very inclusive uh, participation in the in the platform of knowledge production. Uh, so kindly register for us and then uh, keep the discussion going on. Uh, but uh, this is the official end of the webinar, but that doesn't let us, let anyone stop the discussions. So please keep discussing this and uh, using easy Wednesday hashtag and our panelists will get you their uh, as and when our personal capacities uh, permit. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, stay at home and uh, have a nice day or evening or yeah, wherever you're from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.